morning. Good morning. It's great to be here with you. So it's really hard to not dance during that intro song, so I spared you there. So, so, you're welcome. so you're welcome. I did not spare our volunteers earlier this morning when we were making sure it was up and running. I want to I bring a few things to our attention before we jump into the message. So we, we value family here at, at Centerpoint Church. Uh, so we mean that as we collectively, as a church family, we mean that for you wherever you're at, and whatever family means to you, whether maybe you're in my stage of life where you've got some young kiddos, you're, you're married, maybe, maybe you're empty nesters, maybe you're single, whatever family means to you, uh, we affirm that and we want to support you on your journey. And so one of the ways that we get to spread contagious joy and learn humble dependence uh, upon the Lord is to spend time together, not only in a setting like this, in a Sunday service, but also in settings outside. So whether it's on, on a group or on a team, um, we've got a number of those here at Centerpoint. You can learn more about those at centerpointnh.org. Uh, but a couple of ways that we've got that coming up next Sunday, so you wanna mark this on your calendars for next Sunday, um, and both involve food, both involve full lunches, so that's great, right? Uh, amen for that. So we've got coming up next Sunday, our mother-son jam time. That's going to be 1230 to 2 o'clock uh, over in the South Wing. And that's going to be uh, a great time for moms. Come along, bring, bring your kiddos with you, bring your boys with you. And there's going to be outdoor activities, there's going to be inside games, there's going to be crafts. It's going to be a whole bunch of different things. So it's gonna be a meaningful time for everybody who shows up. So make sure you mark that on your calendar. And what's a help to our team is if you can get your tickets in advance. So you can do that. If you haven't yet done that, you can do that out in the commons following the service. So today's the last day to get those tickets. So if you're interested, go on out into the commons, talk to Lauren afterwards. She was up here leading our time of hosting. So we look forward to seeing you there. Second thing I wanna to draw to your attention next Sunday, another luncheon. This is for our Grow uh, that's Global Regional Outreach, so it's a Grow Luncheon. We're going to be uh, hosting next Sunday a couple of missionaries who uh, we're, we're not in partnership with, but they actually have a home base here in New Hampshire. Um, Epsom Bible Church is their sending church. You may have heard of Epsom Bible Great Church. And they, they've been reaching around to other local churches to spread awareness to their missionary work. They're missionaries in Brazil with Word of Life Ministries. And so they reached out to us, and we said, hey, we would love to help you raise awareness to your, to your ministry. So they're gonna be joining us next Sunday. We're gonna hear from them during hosting, and then you, anybody is free to come to the luncheon. But please note, those luncheons are usually in the commons. It's not gonna be in the commons next week. We wanna make space for Mother Son Jam time. So we're gonna have our Grow Luncheon is gonna be upstairs in the large CP Kids room. So you'll hear about that again next weekend as a reminder, but just mark that on your calendars, and we would love to see you there. I wanna pray for us, and then we're gonna go ahead and dive into God's word together this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are, that you are holy, that you are transcendent, that you are the creator who made all things, and yet, by your son, and through your spirit, you make yourself so near to us that you actually take up residency inside those who place their trust in the name of Jesus. God, thank you that you are a God who sees, that you are a God who hears, that you are a God who cares, that you are a God who draws near. We, God, want to live into and out of your story of scripture. And so we ask this morning that as we sit under your story, that we would encounter you both individually and together as a family, as a body of Christ right here. Would you help us to be attentive to your nearness by your Holy Spirit? Would you help us to have ears to hear what it is that you're placing on our hearts and how you're inviting us to respond, to receive and to rest in your love for us? We wanna be storied people empowered by your spirit as we exalt the name of Jesus. We pray this in his name and all God's people said, amen. amen. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me. We're in 1 Samuel chapter seven this morning. If you don't have a Bible, we're gonna have the scripture up on the screen and in the backs of the chairs, there's Bibles there. If you don't yet have a Bible, please feel free to take that Bible with you we love that you're here and we wanna get the Bible into your hands. So please, if you don't have one, take that with you. That's our gift to you. 
As you're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 7, I want to give us a little bit of background because uh, Pastor Matt did the unthinkable last week and did it so successfully, so faithfully. He covered three chapters of scripture. You're going to get 14 verses today. He did three chapters last week. So just a quick, a quick recap. 1 Samuel chapter 4 opened up with the Israelites and they're battling the Philistines who are always a thorn in their side and they're battling the Philistines and at this point in Israel's history, Samuel is coming off of the book of Judges which is this repeated downward spiral where the people of God, the nation of Israel, keep rebelling and turning away from him. He hands them over, out of his love for them, he hands them over to the false gods that they desire to worship. They cry out to him and he raises up a judge or a leader to deliver them. And so this is the theme that then Samuel picks up on because as we'll see here today, Samuel's the last judge in Israel's history before a king comes along. And so in chapter four, where we started last week, was they're battling the Philistines and at this point they become so wayward from God that they go into a battle without consulting God. They go into a battle, they, they, they get routed, they retreat, they say, what did we do wrong? Their plan is, uh, we don't need to talk to God about it. We just need to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which to them would have been symbolically God's hotspot presence in their midst. They're like, just get the Ark, just bring it here, and then we'll win. We'll be fine. So they do that. Not only do they get routed a second time, but now the Ark of the Covenant is captured and taken back into Philistia and actually placed inside the temple of the god Dagon. And uh, we learned last week that God... It is Yahweh, the great I am. He will not be controlled. He cannot be contained. And he will not compete with any other gods. And so Dagon falls. Dagon breaks. God actually then, out of his love for both his people and for the Philistines, uh, falls heavy in his weight and glory on the Philistines. And there's actually some plagues. So this is a reminder for those of us who have read uh, the Old Testament stories of the Exodus were like, oh no, wait, didn't, isn't that what happened to Egypt? And so the Philistines say, this is what happened to Egypt. What are we gonna do? And so instead of going, maybe we should turn to this God, they go, nope, this God can't be controlled. He can't be contained. Get him out of here. So they give him his eviction notice. They load the ark up on a cart. They put two cows. They go, okay, if it goes back to Israel, then we know it was from the God of Israel. And where does it go? Help me out. Back, that's right, back to Israel. So this is where we ended last week, is the ark has returned back to Israel. And this is really interesting. The town that it goes to is called Beth Shemesh. It's just fun to say. Say it with me. Beth Shemesh. Yeah, it's fun. Beth Shemesh. Now, Beth Shemesh is important because in the book of Joshua, as the land is being allotted to the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel, there are cities that are particularly given to the tribe of Levi, because Levi isn't actually given, the tribe of Levi is not given their own land because Levi contains the Levites, eh? the Levites from Levi, who are the priests, who are to actually care for the ark, care for the tabernacle and later the temple and help lead the rest of the tribes in the right relationship with God. And so the ark ends up in Beth Shemesh, which is a Levite town. So you think that's great, right? Like, the people see the ark come in, they celebrate, it's a great time, but oh no, the leaders fail them again. And so the Levites in the city get this brilliant idea, hey, now that the ark's back, we should pop the lid open, we see what's going on inside, right? <laughs> Wrong. No. <laughs> you, don't, you don't do that. W watch this. God is a holy and transcendent God. And to encounter him on our own terms, we, 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 can't, we can't stand in that. Not because he doesn't love us, not because he doesn't want to be with us, but because he's holy, categorically other than us. And so they pop the lid open, and it says 70 of them perish. Why? Because God cannot be contained. He cannot be controlled. And out of his love, he says, this is how you approach me. This is how you draw near to me. And the Levites of this town completely disregard the way that God had invited them to approach him. So as a result, what do they do? He can't be controlled. He can't be contained. Get him out of here. And so they send him out of Beth Shemesh. They send him to the next closest city, 
which is, as we'll pick it up here in our story, Kiriath Jerim. And one note I want to give to you before we read our passage is Kiriath Jerim. You can read about this in Joshua chapter 9. Kiriath Jerim is predominantly populated by a group of people called Gibeonites. Gibeonites, yep, that's right. So the Gibeonites tricked the Israelites as they were entering into the promised land and forced them to make a treaty. They tricked them and they made a treaty so that they wouldn't destroy them. And so they're contained to this city right here, kiriath Jerem. So the Levites fail Israel. They say, get it out of here, get the ark out of here. They send it to kiriath Jerem, where there's some Israelites but mostly Gibeonites. Why? They're like, well, what does it matter to us if they perish? What does it matter to us? Get him out of here. He can't be controlled and can't be contained. Shelf him. And so this is where we pick it up right here. So let's pick it up. Verse one of chapter seven. So the men of kiriath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to guard the ark. The ark remained at kiriath Jerem a long time, 20 years in all. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods of the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and Ashtoreths and serve the Lord only. Then Samuel said, assemble all Israel at Mizpah and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day, they fasted and they confessed, saying, we have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader or judge of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. And they said to Samuel, don't stop crying out to the Lord our God for us that he might rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with a loud thunder against the Philistines and drew them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah, pursuing the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to Israel, and Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace, shalom, between Israel and the Amorites. This is a powerful story. Powerful story of God's deliverance. And what we're going to see this morning is that what God is looking for is a humble and repentant heart that draws near to him as he draws near to us and to you and to me. And so we've already highlighted a couple of the issues going on here as we got into our passage. So you've got the Levites are once again the leaders of the ark of the tabernacle, helping the people come to God. They're failing Israel, and they shelf God by sending him to the city of kiriath Jerem. And it says for 20 years, the ark remained there. It's kind of like they just forgot about him. But it's not just that it's a neutral thing happening here, because verses three and four tell us that they're actually then continuing to serve foreign gods or false gods. So they're serving Baal, and they're serving Asherah. Now, I want to show you guys a picture of Baal, if we can bring that up on the screen. Thank you, thank you. So this is Baal. Baal, in the ancient Near Eastern context, was known primarily as a storm god. It's going to be important, so just file that one away. He was a storm god, so that might not mean much to us today, because we just go to the grocery store, get some food, I'm hungry, I just open up my fridge at night. But in this day and age, they lived off of their land. Right? So rain was really, really important, meaning no rain equaled famine, equaled no food, equaled really bad for people. Right? 
So Baal is the storm god. He's in control of the rain. Really important. You can see kind of on Baal's head, he's got a helmet there, uh, and it's got bull horns. So Baal is often depicted as riding a bull, so throwing this one in for free. I'm not going to charge you for this one, but for free. Uh, anytime you see Israel bowing down to bulls, it's sus. It's big time sus. It's suspect. And think of Baal. Okay, so this is what's happening here with the bulls. Um, and he's, he's, he's full of baloney. So in his hand, you'll also see this staff. Um, it kinda, it's kind of coming up and branching. It's actually supposed to look like a lightning bolt, again, because he's the god of storms. So he's known for his thunder and his lightning. That's how he flexes. And this is Baal. And so kind of his consort, uh, the, the female deity who would roll with him was sometimes known as Asherah, sometimes known as Ashereth. Uh, and they would kind of go together. And so she is known for fertility and love and war, actually. And so they would, they would roll together. And so here's Israel. Why worship the living God when you can worship false gods? Really bad idea. Why? Because in verse 3, we learn that because they're worshiping these false gods, they're under the hand of the Philistines. So for this entire 20-year period that they shelf God, and put him off to the side because he's, he's too hot to handle. They shelf him, and this whole time they're being oppressed by the hand of the Philistines. And this is really important because we become like the gods that we worship. You are what you love. And these false foreign gods, these idols, and we looked at this last week that idols are still alive and well today. The idols that we bow down to with our time, our money, our relationships, our whole being, we bow down to them because they have some in our eyes, some, they can save us from something, they can help us escape from something. They end up holding us fast in bondage and slavery. And this is how an idol works. It presents itself as, come to me, I will save you. And no, no I'm gonna hold you fast. And you're gonna be stuck. And so this is what Israel is experiencing here as they're continuing to worship these false gods. Now notice at the end of verse two, it says that after this 20 years is up, it says all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. That phrase turn back is actually really ambiguous in the original language. It looks a little confusing. It's probably actually more accurate to say that they're drawn together after the Lord So this is not quite yet repenting. They've not yet quite turned to him fully. They're in the process of beginning the turn as they're being drawn back to him. And this is important because not only does the worship of false gods hold us fast, but it actually creates within us a restlessness and a longing and a yearning for something more. It's like Saint Augustine once said, he said, God, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So I don't know where you find yourself this morning. Like I don't, I don't have the privilege of knowing every single person in this room, but God knows you. He made you. He knows where you're at on your journey. And so some of us here in a crowd this size this morning some of us here are coming in and we're going, I, I, I don't even really know why I'm here. I'm not really open to this Jesus thing. I don't really even know who he is. But yet, if you're honest, there's something stirring within you. And you've, you've tried things in life and they've left you wanting. Or maybe you're experiencing hardship and you're going, I don't know where else to turn. Maybe for others of you in here, you're going, yeah, I've tried the Jesus thing. And it really feels like he's abandoned me. It really feels like he's just set me to the side. Like you're talking, Joe, about the Israelites shelving God. What about when he shelves me? It can feel like he's so far away. And yet there's a restlessness. There's a longing for something more, a yearning, knowing I was made for more than whatever this is and that I find myself in right now. Or maybe others of you in here, you are faithfully following Jesus and yet you're going through the ringer. You're going through a very difficult time and there's a restlessness like, 
Where's God in the midst of this storm? I, I read about how he's on the boat with the disciples in the midst of the storm, but it sure feels like he's asleep. Wherever you find yourself, here's our takeaway, is that in the restlessness, the restlessness is an invitation. The restlessness is an invitation to turn to the Lord. It's not actually evidence that he's left you. It's not actually evidence that he's abandoned you. It's evidence that he's at work in ways through his Holy Spirit in ways that you might not yet be aware of. But because he loves you, let that hit you. He loves you. He's drawing you to himself because he loves you. So what do we do in this restlessness? Well, like the Israelites, it's an invitation to turn to the Lord. So let's look at verses three and four. So Samuel said to the Israelites, if you are returning, so now there's our word for repentance, we'll talk about that in a minute. If you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods of the Ashtoreths and commit yourself to the Lord and serve him only and he'll deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So Israel put away their Baals, they put away their Ashtoreths, and they served the Lord only. This is a beautiful invitation that they take God up on. So there's this restlessness and this yearning. They're not quite sure if God's abandoned them or not, which he hasn't. They're not sure, though. Their lived experience might say otherwise. And Samuel, like a good, godly, faithful leader, he says, no, 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 God is right here. He is at work right here. You don't see it. You might not be aware of it, but he's at work right now. Here's the invitation. Return to him. In the original language, this is the word shuv. You can turn to your neighbor and say shuv. Shuv. Not shove, but shuv. So that means to turn back, to repent. So it's this, it's this idea that the Israelites, they were stuck fast in bondage to the Baals, to the Ashtoreths, and they were walking this way, and now God's saying, put, put those down, let them fall, let them shatter, and now you're gonna turn, and with your will and your whole person, you individually and together are gonna walk this way with me because this is the way of life. And so what do they do? Is they actually take him up on this. They recognize that holding fast to these foreign, these foreign gods, these idols, these false gods, that their core desires of needing to belong in community, to belong to this God who's bigger than themselves, it's not being met here in these false gods. In fact, they're held fast. They're, they're, they're learning that, that not only is this belonging, but their, their desire for significance, these core desires that we all have, it's not being met here. This, these foreign gods are holding them fast. Right? We talk, Pastor Matt talked about this last week with these core desires. And then their, their desire for peace is certainly not being met by these foreign false gods. There's this restlessness, this discontentment within them. And so as they set these gods down and they turn to Yahweh, the living God, the creator of all things, they're receiving his love for them, walking into and out of his love for them, and they're experiencing, oh, oh, the desires weren't bad. They were disordered, bent and twisted by the evil one to lead us astray to these false gods, and now these desires, I see how they can be met by the transcendent creator God of the universe. My belonging, my significance, and my peace, and our peace and belonging and significance is found in him and him alone. Amen. And so they turn to him, they repent, they change direction, because they know that they can't walk in two directions at the same time. And then we see in verse four, it says that they put these false gods away and they serve the Lord only. This is beautiful. This is what it looks like to have a humble heart, individually and together as a body. Humble hearts before the Lord. What is humility? Humility is acknowledging our weakness, 
our limits, our neediness, our need for being dependent upon something, in this case someone, greater than ourselves, the maker of our souls, the maker of our whole persons. And humility, it's not, it's not being this, this doormat for other people to walk on. No, it's actually, it's saying, God, I need you. I can't do this in my own strength. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you all of this, right? And now as I'm gonna make this turn, I want you to take all of this and all of us with the gifts, the talents, the possessions, the resources, the education, everything that we have, and we're gonna lay it at your feet, God, because we want you to do with us as you will. Why? Because we have confidence that you love us. You are for us. Oh, and so independency, I lay it down to you. And when we do that, we, like the nation of Israel here, we become dependent upon him and interdependent upon one another because this isn't just for me, myself, and I. We get to do this together in community so that we can be a city on the hill and a light to the nations right here in this city today and in our neighborhoods, in our places of work, and in our schools, and in our families. Joining with him as we receive his love, we become conduits of his love out into the world. So it says that they served him, they served the Lord only. They're giving him everything is his to be used by him. Now, you would think that's probably a great ending for the story. Like, that'd be awesome if the story just ended there, but it doesn't. Why? Because like a good, faithful leader, Samuel knows that you gotta strike while the iron's hot. The people are in the process of turning back to God, but what they haven't yet realized, they haven't taken ownership of their past. Hasn't happened yet. He says they're recognizing that they broke God's laws, but now they need to recognize that they've also broken his heart. Come back to him. And so what does he do? Verses five and six. He assembles the whole nation, all 12 tribes, at Mizpah, and he says, I will intercede. That means he'll intervene on their behalf. Because remember, they were so wayward. This is like the impression we get is, they don't even know how to pray at this point. So he's helping them relearn how to pray. So he's gonna intercede for them. And it says, when they assembled at Mizpah, they drew water, they pour it out, they fast, they confess. And here are their words, we've sinned against the Lord. Now, a couple of important things to observe here. The last time Mizpah is mentioned is at the end of the book of Judges. When Israel gathers together, 11 of the 12 tribes gather together to wage civil war on the tribe of Benjamin. It's the last time that they assembled together at Mizpah. It was really bad. You can read about it in your own time. It was, it was ugly. Not only had they become like the Canaanite nations, they had become worse than the Canaanite nations, killing their own kinsmen. And so what God is helping us to see is that he wants to redeem all things, even our past. Even your past. You know, the thing that some of us want to run from. The thing that some of us get so easily stuck in. He wants to rescue us in freedom and healing from our past. Notice their words. They collectively say, we have sinned against the Lord. That word sin, it means moral failing. Moral failing, specifically, a failure to love God and a failure to love one another. This is why Jesus comes later and he says the greatest command is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's the greatest command. Amen. Right? So they're acknowledging that this is what they have done. So they are taking healthy ownership of not only their own sin, but the sin of the generations that had gone before them that you can read about in the book of Judges, and it is ugly. It's ugly. They're taking ownership. And again, this is really important because the invitation for us today is a recognition that God wants to bring healing and freedom even from our past. So some of us in here think that our past prevents us from serving God. 
we're stuck, we think we've disqualified ourselves. Others of us in here, we, we maybe have done things to other people or we've had things done to us by other people that we think surely when God sees me, I'm just shameful, I'm not worth anything. Why would God allow that to happen to me? Like these are all legitimate responses, by the way. It's called being human when we're sinned against. Wherever you find yourself in relationship to your past, or maybe, or maybe your past is, yeah, there was some stuff that happened in my family where we kind of like just sweep it under the rug and we move along because we're, we're just focused on the future, right? Because the reality is, is that until we allow Jesus to bring healing to our past, we're always gonna be walking with a limp in the present and into the future, right? So he wants, he loves you so much, right? He wants to bring healing to you, even in the difficult places of your past. And so it's an invitation to walk with him in that journey, to walk in community with trusted individuals who will help you in that journey. So again, this could be another spot where we go, great place to end the passage. But no, we're still not done. Because verse seven happens. So as the community is gathered together and it's this beautiful, collective, communal confession, that means to agree with God that what we've done, we've not, we've not been walking in your ways and here's how we've not. And as this beautiful assembly is happening, as God is doing a deep heart work in his people individually and together collectively, verse seven, it comes thundering in. Here's what it says. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. So the Philistines mistake what's happening as, oh boy, Israel's gathering for war. They're going to attack us. So how do we defend ourselves and protect ourselves? Well, we attack better and we attack first. So they gather. Now, this is a climactic moment in this passage. It might not feel like it, but this is so climactic because of everything that has unfolded before this story. Remember chapter four, when the Israelites were battling with the Philistines and they were pretty flippant. They were like, yeah, yeah, God will, God will rescue us. Like, bring, bring the ark on in. Yeah, that's where we went wrong. Bring it on in. They don't consult the Lord. They don't seek the Lord. They don't cry out to the Lord. They take him for granted. They turn him into a token. And in the book of Judges, even before that, was this downward spiral of rebellion and waywardness where they would wander away from him, serve these false gods, right? And so that's all in the backdrop of what's gonna happen here because we're going, how are they gonna respond? Like, are they, are they gonna embrace the bad news of what's going on here? The Philistines are about to attack them. To then turn to Yahweh, the living God, to embrace the good news that he wants to rescue them? Or, or are they going to turn back to old patterns, old habits, or old gods and cry out to other things and look in other places and other people to rescue them? Like, this is where we're at. This is a huge moment in this story. Because I don't know about you, but I know this from my own experience. Old gods die hard. Like they don't go down without a fight. And so the enemy is breathing down their necks right here and here is their response. Verse eight. They said to Samuel, do not stop crying out to the Lord our God. Notice they're not saying Samuel cried to your God. Our God. They finally get it. The light bulb moment. Our God. Why? Because he's for us. That he might rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Oh, this is such an amazing response. <laughs> such an amazing response. It's hard for us to put ourselves in this situation, but just in your mind's eye, think about what this would be like at this moment. Like, we've already read the rest of the story. We know where it's going. We're like, yeah, resolution. God delivers them. But in this moment, they didn't know that yet. And so the Philistines are knocking on their front door, ready to kick it in and come in and slaughter Israel. What would you do in this moment? <laughs> I, I don't know what I would do. I'm not sure if I would respond this way. So they double down. 
And in their fear, they say, we get it. Cry out to Yahweh that he would deliver us because he is for us and he wants to rescue us. This is faith. This is not merely a mental assent to a belief, though that is important, right? Belief is important. This is embodied trust. This is what faith is. Embodied trust. When we can't see what's going to happen, and we double down in embodied trust and say, I'm putting this in your hands because I know that you are for me. And it might not work out the way that I desire it, but I still know that you're for me. And I still know that you are with me through your Holy Spirit. And so their response is embodied trust. And then Samuel offers this sacrifice, right? This is, the sacrifice is a whole burnt offering. It's a symbol of the Israelites are being completely dependent upon God. They're surrendering everything that they have to God. Like this is a weird battle strategy. <laughs> you got the enemy knocking at your door and your battle strategy is let's pray and let's offer the sacrifice. But this is the right strategy. This is why Paul says in the New Testament that the weapons of our warfare are not of the world. It's prayer that destroys and demolishes strongholds. So what is God's response to this? I I love the end of verse nine. It says, so as Samuel's offering this and he's crying out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, the Lord answered him. The Lord answered him. The Lord answered him. He hasn't yet done anything. (laughs) God still hasn't responded, but the answer's already been given. And the people are waiting in reliance upon the Lord, in humble trust, waiting. And verse 10, while Samuel was sacrificing the offering, the Philistines drew near, can you feel it? Can you hear the clanging of the swords? Can you smell the stinky breath of the Philistines? "Ah, We're ready to get you. Like, this is where they were. And what does God do? On that day, the Lord thundered with a loud thunder. It's the thunder. It's the thunder, yeah. He thundered with a loud thunder. Why is that important? Do you remember what Baal was the god of? Storms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I forgot to tell you that Baal was actually Dagon's son. How about that? Yeah. So Dagon's already been toppled by Yahweh. Now Yahweh's like, this ain't nothing. Gone. And he thunders this great thunder. So it's this idea of, he, he brings about a great thunderstorm that throws the Philistines into a panic. And they scatter, it's like ratatouille, they scatter. Let's go everywhere, right? They scatter. And then Israel pursues them and takes them down. And this, this word here, where he thunders this loud thunder against the Philistines, verse 10, and threw them into such a panic. That word panic, that is a, that is a glowing hyperlink. Wom, wom, wom. If we click, it'll bring us to the Exodus story where God shows up and he's protecting the Israelites as they're being pursued by Pharaoh and his chariots, and they're crossing the sea, because it's a lot of people, so it took a long time to cross the sea. And God is this pillar of fire and this cloud protecting them. And then he throws them into a panic, and they they go headlong into the waters, and then he allows the waters to come back in on them. Yeah? This, This word that's glowing here for panic, if we click on it, it also takes us to God's covenant, that means his promises, his promise to Israel, that as they go into the promised land, that what he'll do is he'll, he'll, he'll take those people and put them into a panic and drive them out. Yeah, like all that's right here. This is, the Bible's so cool. This is how the Bible works. It's so awesome, I love it. Nerd moment, there we go. Um, and so this is, this is the author reminding us God upholds his promises. Why? Because he loves us and because He is making a way for one who will be greater than even Samuel to one day come and be the ultimate leader leading his people into the true land of promise. So there's this great victory. And what does Samuel do in response? It says, verse 12, he takes a stone and he sets it up and he names it Ebenezer. That might not mean much to us. We might think of Ebenezer Scrooge. There we go. I had to get that out there because we're all thinking it. If we turn back to chapter four though, Ebenezer was the place where they lost and got routed and lost the ark. 
So the passage is again, God is again showing us he is interested in redeeming our past. So where they lost the ark was named Ebenezer and now Samuel's saying, ah, here's the real Ebenezer. Stone of help, that's what Ebenezer means. And he sets this stone up where they, they have this great victory as a reminder of God's faithfulness. And what happens as a result? There's peace. The hand of the Philistines is removed. God's hand is actually against the Philistines now, excuse me, for the foreseeable future. The towns that the Philistines had captured in verse 14 are restored back to Israel. And all seems like it's going really well. And it is. But here's where the passage ends. Look at Samuel's words after he names this stone Ebenezer. He says in verse 12, thus far the Lord has helped us. So this is like TBC. This is like Samuel's way of being like to be continued. (laughs) Why? Because following the Lord is not just a one-time decision. It's not less than that. It is an ongoing decision as life unfolds that we continue to trust him. We continue to follow him. We continue to receive his love for us. And it's the ultimate to be continued because As we'll see, Samuel ends up, like he's a great leader, but he ends up not being the one who delivers Israel. And then we just cycle through the rest of the Old Testament. Testament means covenant, so the rest of the Old Covenant. (laughs) And we just see one after the next after the next. We're waiting for the one who will be the ultimate deliverer, who will be the ultimate stone of help, who will be the ultimate Levite, the ultimate high priest, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate advocate, one who will stand in the gap on behalf of all of humanity who has in their default DNA waywardness, rebellion, and wandering apart from their maker. And then we get to the New Testament, the new covenant, and we meet a guy, and he's more than just a guy. He is God in flesh, and his name is Jesus. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate intercessor, the one who intervenes on our behalf. Jesus is the one who makes a way for the forgiveness of your sin and of my sin. Jesus is the one who overtook the ultimate enemies of death, the devil, Jesus is the one who is the king over everything and he is the one who has won the battle, victory over the powers and principalities in the heavenly places. And how did he do all of that? By offering himself as the ultimate sacrifice, allowing death to swallow him whole, that he might come out the other side raised by the Holy Spirit, who now that same Holy Spirit, we are told that for those of us who place our faith, our embodied trust in Jesus, in his finished work and forgiveness of sins on the cross, that that same Holy Spirit will dwell in you and in me and in us together if we've trusted in Jesus. That same Spirit now lives in us. He is for you He is with you and he is in you by his spirit. And so as we wrap this up, I don't know where you're at on your journey today. Maybe you're hearing this and you've never taken that initial step of crossing the threshold into the family of faith, the family of God through Jesus. He's your ultimate intercessor. He is the one through whom we can know God and be in right relationship with God. Today is the day. If you sense him moving, in your life. You might feel that emotionally. You might be having thoughts like, this is what I need to do. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you in out of his love for you. So after the service, we're gonna have our prayer team up here. I wanna invite you, be brave, invite you, come up and talk to one of our team members. They will help you with any questions that you have, like, I don't know what's happening right now. It's the Holy Spirit at work. He loves you. They will walk you through coming to faith. And then for those of us here who we know Jesus, we're walking with him, this passage is a reminder, what is he looking for? A humble and repentant heart. 
that is open to receiving his hand of blessing and love that we might be hands and feet of blessing and love into the world around us as he brings us healing and wholeness and peace and shalom. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're teaching us here today. And I ask God that anyone who is receiving this and they don't yet know your son Jesus, God, show them right now how much you love them. Draw them to yourself. Help them to be brave, to come forward, to talk to one of our prayer team volunteers. And then for those of us who know your son, Father, would you please remind us afresh of your love for us, how you want to meet us in tough places in our past, how you're looking for us to take the false gods and areas of our lives that we still might be worshiping, knowingly or unknowingly, and lay them at your feet that we would walk in greater degrees of healing and freedom and joy and love out of your love for us. I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. Be blessed this week as you walk in the healing touch of Jesus.